Hey everyone, I'm here all to talk about what can happen if you take life too seriously. Uh, I think the shirt I have on today is really good. It's a Jersey Strong shirt. So in 2013, we had Hurricane Sandy, which devastated the Jersey Shore. Uh, my dad had about three to six feet of water in his, in his home, and it was really bad. And if you ever go online and just go into Google and type in Hurricane Sandy from the Jersey Shore, you can look at all sorts of photos from Seaside, Lava, Lavalette, Manilok. And there was an area in New Jersey that was a really nice area. It literally cut through the entire landmass and there was a 20 foot channel where people's really nice homes were and people were just driving boats through it. Uh, it was really, really bad. So I, I think this shirt is very applicable talking about what can just happen if we take life a little bit too seriously. And there's nothing wrong with being serious about life and holding yourself accountable on the recovery journey. But I think that, you know, just overall extreme righteousness and extreme shame and guilt that's coming from this is the way life should be. This is so terrible how this could happen to me. These are really the most perpetuating belief systems that are causing shame and guilt. Chronic shame and chronic guilt, chronic depression in most cases, chronic anger, resentment, anxiety. These aren't coming for no reason. There's almost always, if not always, some sort of a belief that's added onto a particular situation. Even if you have something that you can't get better from, like a terminal cancer, there's still a belief system that's perpetuating those chronicity and those symptoms for long periods of time. Before I go any further, please subscribe. Let me know what you think about this. This will be a little bit of a personal video for me. I'm going to talk about my dad dying, uh, my dogs dying, my aunt dying, just other things that happened to me in my life and why stepping back a little bit and having the joking manner I like to have while balancing that with seriousness, I think it's been one of the best things that's ever happened to me and all the people I coach and all the people I'm friends with. And if you need help with this, if you're really struggling with some really bad depression, for an example, or you're really just angry at certain things that happen to you in your life or family members, please reach out at phil at ocdrecovery.com and we'll get back to you in a timely fashion. We could certainly help you break down beliefs. So as many of you know, my father died of cancer uh, five years ago, five years ago in March. So I have uh, the date tattooed right here, which is March 28th, 2018 with his name tattooed above it. I was at a conference with my wife. I was sitting in the McDonald's parking lot when the phone call came in. My dad was a larger than life character. I remember when it came, when it came in and I said, Hey, you know, I was very excited to tell him I was a year into grad school uh, for three and a half years. And I was so excited to tell him about this first large convention I was going to. And I remember, if I close my eyes and think about it, he answered the phone and he said, hey, I just knew something wasn't right because he never did that um, because of the personality that I was so accustomed to knowing. And I said, what's going on? He said, I have to tell you something. I have a 10 centimeter tumor on my pancreas. Um, yeah, that, that was devastating, obviously. Uh, and I said to him, is it on your liver? I had just taken gastro, which is, you know, everything in this region right here, pathology, which is study of disease. And I said to him, is it on your liver? Because anything that goes on your liver is big trouble. Uh, liver is a very important organ in your body, has many functions. And he said, yeah, I have three spots on my liver. And I, I don't know what happened. Many people have heard me. I just blurted out. I said, you're dead. I, I, I don't know. I just said, you're dead. And then uh, my wife started to cry, uh, which she wasn't my wife at the time. She wasn't even my fiance, fiance at the time. But yeah, it was it was really, really bad. Um, right? Was it in 19, 20, 21, 22, 23? Yeah, we weren't married yet. Don't mess your marriage dates up. I got married on the 19, in 19. I have a tattooed right there. I'm like, was I married yet? Idiot. Oh my gosh, typical guy scenario right there for most people. Girls are like, they know the date and guys are like, after five years, you're like, what day did we get married? Where did we get married again? <laughs> So, and it was really, really tough to get that phone call. Um, and, you know, I've always, I would say I had a moderately good perspective on death. That doesn't mean I'm not concerned about it. It doesn't mean I don't want to die. It just, I'm not, I don't have an overarching fear of death, probably because I wasn't raised, um, not always, but I wasn't raised in a very religious household where death and God and heaven and hell and sinning was a big factor. Depending on who you talk to, they might think that's really sad. I think it's very good. I'm very happy my parents did not raise me religious. I'm happy I can make that decision for myself. As most people know, I've, I'm, I'm an atheist. And you can't be an atheist, but I practice atheism, which just means I don't believe in an afterlife, but I could be wrong. 
So there's no shame or guilt or worry with that. And, uh, it would be cool if there was an afterlife. No, that would be nice to be wrong on that. But the reality is there's probably a really good chance there's nothing because there was nothing before life that we can remember. There's probably nothing after life. One of the biggest drivers and uh, all fear or all fear patterns around morals is whether I'm a bad person in this life and then punished in the next life, et cetera. So my father dying was, was, was really bad. And he, I remember I saw him in hospice and I was walking. I had got home. I was at Ultra in Miami because he was very good at not wanting to scare the family. So my sister had messaged me on Saturday. I remember being at the techno stage and surrounded by 30,000 people. And my sister said, you got to come home tomorrow. I said, what do you mean you have to come home tomorrow? She's like, dad is in hospice. I said, what? He told me to, what? So he hit it really well. So I came home and I remember I'm walking through the hallways and like the doors are open up a movie. I'm looking in all these rooms and I look to the right and from a lateral vision. So looking this way, there was a nurse feeding a, a person in a chair who had no hair and was like jaundiced this color. Um, and I continued to walk and my sister started to cry. I said, what's, what's going on? She said, that's that. I said, there's no way. And I went in there and it was my dad. And that was really tough. That was really tough. So I don't know what I was thinking in the moment because it was so long ago, but I remember I went into the bathroom and I really just started to cry because that was really hard to see him like that. And then he died that night. Uh, so I got to see him before he died, which is awesome. And then we went and I said goodbye to his body before we cremated him. And then I have his ashes in the necklace. And then three months later, my mom lost her only sibling. She showed up to my father's funeral. She was literally twice as yellow as this, even twice as jaundiced as my father. And my mom said, freaking, freaking, literally at the grave of my father, at the grave with everyone. And my mom said, what's going on with my sister? And I, I said, well, you're, you're going to another funeral soon. She died three months later. Then my mom lost a dog. I slept in her bed for, I don't know, eight years. So it was really tough on my mother. My mom and my dad were divorced for 10, 15 years, but they were still really good friends. They hung out together. They still talk daily. They were very, um, you know, they, they kept a good relationship. So that was really tough. And I don't think my mom wanted to believe it when she got the phone call. You know, my mom said, I have a story in my mind where my mom said, you know, I was walking through uh, before she retired. She works in the medical office as a biller and, and doing desk work. And, and she said, uh, you know, Tony has, has pancreatic cancer, stage four. She said all four women were dead silent. And my mom said at that, at that moment I knew she, cause maybe she didn't want to believe it, but she knew it was bad, but she thought maybe it was more like a testicular cancer or maybe a prostate cancer where there's good outcomes, not like a brain or a liver, liver, but pancreatic cancer is always in the top three worst type of cancers to get. If you have stage four, cause I usually find it late when symptoms are showing, it's usually metastasized. It's usually spread unless it's caught in some random early stage. Most people don't catch uh, pancreatic cancer underneath stage three, to my knowledge. When they catch it at stage four, you're basically dead. So, and he lived seven months, and then that happened. So, and then I read a lot. Okay, I want to transition now. I wanted to open up with that story with you because I know a lot of people are afraid of losing their parents, magical thinking, and everything else. I, I coach people who, who have that particular fear, et cetera. So, um, I read a lot of books. I enjoy reading. I don't get to read as much as I'd like to nowadays because I have a lot of other obligations, such as making content. I have a... a Goal to hit 30 YouTube videos this month and 200 plus TikToks and all the other stuff I do. And so sometimes I allocate my time towards different things and, and, and then I can change gears in, in the future. But I do read a lot. Sometimes I go through periods where I read, you know, four or five books in a month. And I read a lot of books on other people regarding psychology and, and, and top psychologists and mindsets and everything like that. And the number one thing I've, I've come to realize with a lot of the modern day authorities that we see in mental health and psychology and psychiatry is a lot of people take life entirely too seriously in my, in my opinion. Now, because righteousness is directly tied with religion, there's, it's important to talk about this. Now, it's always important to say that there's nothing wrong with being religious. There's nothing inherently wrong with having values that are coming from Christianity, Judeo-Christian, um, you know, uh, Buddhism, any philosophy, if you're practicing Muslim, etc. The problem or the potential problem comes from that over-concern and that extreme righteousness, which is based around this shouldn't be like this. So I'll, I'll, what we're going to talk about for the remainder of the video is a lot of conditional acceptance, condition, I'm sorry, conditional life acceptance, because uh, that's really the main thing that's keeping a lot of people stuck. And so a lot of people have been asking me to keep up with the writing. And so I'll do that. And I'm going to pull the whiteboards back again soon. Um, just sometimes I, 
the whiteboards take a little bit more time for me to methodically write that stuff out. So what we have is we have CLA, okay? So CLA is conditional life acceptance. And it's really important to cover this because when you look at most cases of depression, and when I say most, I mean almost 100%. Now, there are times in postpartum depression or other things such as concussions where there are extreme hormone issues, but a lot of it is coming from beliefs. If I sat down with 100 people that were diagnosed with MDD, major depressive disorder, or the fear of depression or whatever they have, I can almost always see beliefs that are based around conditional life right away, but they've been explained this incorrectly. So those beliefs look like this. Let me use a different color. That way it will look a little bit good and I'll hold this up because I do think it is really good for, for individuals to see this. Okay, so my life should be easy. Now, this goes directly into the fear of fear, which is the fear of OCD being too difficult to handle, the fear of not being able to handle new tasks in my life. Another big one is it's horrible. This is a really big one. It's horrible if X, Y, Z happened. Now, this goes way beyond OCD. This goes into uh, panic disorder. This goes into PTSD. Most chronic shame and chronic guilt from PTSD, it runs very similar to OCD. We don't specialize in PTSD, but we work with a lot of people who have extreme PTSD. And we see that it's the same principles of OCD which is there's a belief system. There's usually much more conditional life and conditional self. Let's use a very simple example. Someone was in the war of Afghanistan, um, you know, in the, in the Middle East, and maybe they made a wrong decision and they made a wrong call and a Humvee went and got blown up and four of their friends died. And this stuff happens. It's important to highlight this stuff. I mean, one of my favorite things um, that I was reading recently in Jordan Peterson's new book, which there's a lot of things I like about that book, and there's a lot of things I, I definitely do not like about that book. And because I get so many people that ask me about um, Peterson, because he's one of the top authorities in psychology and, and mental health, it, I think it is important sometimes to address that. And I think that he is one of the he's one of the worst when it comes to what I'm talking about. These conditional life beliefs based on guilt and shame that are coming from these strong conditional righteousness beliefs about the life shouldn't be. And if I had Peterson as a, if I was coaching him, which would sound funny because most people would say to me, "Oh, you know, why why would anyone why would he listen to you?" But I do think I'm pretty confident in saying that I sit him down because he doesn't know more about anxiety than us. And there's no way. We work with it all day long. And because of our experiences, he's never had chronic OCD. And that's not a bad thing. He's better at a thousand other things than I'm not. But on this particular topic, I think I might be able to teach him a thing or two from my experiences and show him, hey, look, Jordan, you're holding these really strong belief systems based around life and shame and guilt. I've read both your books a few times. I read 12 Rules of Life. I haven't read Maps for Meaning. And I've listened to a lot of his, his videos. And that that extreme guilt and shame he's feeling is coming from that utterly black and white rigid beliefs about how life should be and how people should be. And he uses a lot of big terms like hellish on earth or worst possible thing ever or the biggest sinner of all times and these, these very strong dogmatic statements which can just be broken down and just kind of chipped away and much more preferences and he can hold the same exact views. And I'm, I'm not, if Jordan Pierce never finds this, I'm, 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 you are an incredible figure in, in, and I, I enjoy so much of listening to you. I'll listen to you for the rest of my life. But this particular one thing I think you really would benefit from working on. You don't have to experience the shame and guilt that you're experiencing. Um, it would be very unique if you found this video. And I, I would, if, if that would just be really cool. Um, because I, I do think this is something that really holds him back. So my life should be easy. It's horrible if X, Y, Z happens. Again, it's PTSD, real event, false memory. And then um, I can't live with myself. And that's for whatever reason, right? And that's where the shame and guilt comes in. That could be from an event, something you said. So we have the conditional life acceptance. These are the beliefs. So this is the activating event up here. I'll just put an A. So this is the A plus the B. And, and just doing this, ladies and gentlemen, isn't enough. You are going to have to embody this and experience this. It will take time to shift your beliefs. It's, it's a similar thing where if you went outside, you don't have to look at the sky and say, hey, is this blue? Is it green? And, and of course, with OCD, you could, you could do that. But I'm saying for the most part, your brain is believed or is on board for the fact right now that it is blue. Someone's going to watch that and say, why would you say that? Now I have these fears based around this. But you got to be willing to hear everything. And then what happens is because you have these strong life acceptance beliefs, you have a lot of 
And these are the unhealthy emotions, right? Guilt, shame, envy, righteousness. And righteousness can be very dangerous. Um, cause that's, that's extreme greed and, um, and, and envy and, and, and vengeance, et cetera. Um, anger, I'll put anger slash rage. And so that's it right there. That's the full dip sheet. So you have the activating event, which is life should be easier. It should be more fun. Then we have the belief system, which is, you know, my life should be easy. It's horrible. If X, Y, Z happened. I can't live with myself. And that perpetuates extremely bad and, and, and aggressive shame and guilt, righteousness, and anger, anger and rage. Now, you know, I do want to spend a few minutes before the end of the video talking about these are not something you're going to ever rid yourself of from the normal sense. So I, I always explain guilt and shame are not unhealthy if they're in balance. So I'll give you an example. Let's say you've been doing something that you want to change behavior and you're feeling a little bit of healthy dosages of guilt, a more drip, like a little guilt, a little guilt, nothing chronic towards majorly distressed in your life. And you say, you know, I don't really like this guilt and that can motivate you to want to change. And then you'll, you'll do the behaviors. And as the behaviors, when you're not feeling like doing it, when you're feeling like shame and guilt, that could do that. So, you know, and I'm going to top, top off this video about how I live my life and what I like to do for myself and, and why I think that taking life seriously, but having the balance that you'll never be able to get right. And when I say balance, I don't mean balance in the sense that most people say, I don't believe in that. It's like perfect third scenario. I'm actually quite unbalanced. I work probably a little bit too much. I exercise a little bit too much, but I have no regret and I have no anxiety about that because I've accepted the overall way I want to live my life. And that's just for another video. And maybe I'll do a video titled something along the lines of how do you live an unbalanced life without anxiety? I think it actually be a really good video. So, um, you know, I really go all in on things and I was really bad with lying to myself and others about progress I was making. And I really wanted to go for life. And I love music festivals. I, where I kept the ultra wristband on, I always get joked about, I wear that every year and I'll wear that for the remainder of my life. Um, uh, every year until I go again, uh, I love hanging out. I love trying new foods. I like going out there. I'm not in the tip top shape I used to be in, but I'm in good enough shape. I, and uh, I enjoy I enjoy foods. I, I just got back from a great hike today with our team and our business, and and we went. And it was hot. It was like 35 degrees Celsius, and it was pounding down. And then we went out afterwards, and I got this really good pressed panini sandwich with these chili cheese fries that were just covered. And Erica hates the way I eat them because like I take the fries and dip it in the marinara, so it's like on me. And I, well, I look like a Nor and they just look like a Neanderthal. And it's just a great cider beer. I love ciders. Um, I like watching new things. I like challenging myself. I like reading books on things I don't particularly enjoy with. I go on all spectrums of the political stuff. I read stuff on capitalism. I read stuff on socialism. I read the Communist Manifesto. Uh, and I try to take pieces of stuff from that. I try to be as open-minded as I can. That doesn't mean I don't have strong opinions on things, as I certainly do. But I try to decrease the strength of those opinions to where I'm always willing to hear people out. Uh, I like challenge myself in hikes. I like listening to comedy. I like joking around. I like making fun of people. And I love when people make fun of me. So please make fun of me. If you want to leave a joke about me, everyone always jokes about the, and this is key for OCD and anxiety recovery and my TikToks and stuff like that. I think that one of the best things you could do in life is to be able to joke around about your condition, whatever you have. I have met people with serious conditions. I always joke about our friend Keith, who's a massage therapist, who's blind, who had some of the best. We went axe throwing, okay? At one of the axe throwing places. And he was like, is anyone in front of me? I'm going to kill you. And it just was so cool to see that. Not saying he doesn't struggle, but, you know, being able to poke fun of that decreases that. And, and again, this is... um. This, these beliefs right here, I read them a lot in people's books, a lot of stuff when people go through serious atrocities and we're not taking them away from the validity or the seriousness of people's events who've lost family members to murder or, or anything, sexual assaults or genocide or anything, but you can change. That's why Viktor Frankl's book is on the reading list. You'll still have sorrow. You'll still have depression potentially at times regarding, but that seriousness of the chronicity won't be there as much because you've been able to change your beliefs. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Life is extremely brief. Um, that can cripple you. That can turn you into anger against the world. I don't believe what the Buddha statement and the existential statement and Arthur Schopenhauer, the godfather of pessimism, that life is suffering. I don't agree with that. Life has suffering, but it's what you choose to make from your experiences of your suffering that changes your life. I have to say my emotional suffering has been bad. I was in a mental hospital. I didn't want to be here, but... Thankfully, I'm here and I get to help all of you. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed. And as always, have a great day. Oh, and fill at OCDrecovery.com.